And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildred, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. He is a best-selling author of his own right, and is, and is putting out not one but two volumes of his series, Dreamers of Andalon. The one and only T.B. Phillips. How are you doing tonight, man? Hey, I'm wonderful. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited. Thanks for, com thanks for coming on. I did, see the I did see the announcement you posted um, back in September that um, the first book, Andalon Awakens, is getting an audiobook. Yes, any day. Um, actually, they're backlogged with Audible right now, so they're saying 30 working days to get it through. So hopefully that means by this Wednesday. If it's not out by this Wednesday, we've got to call somebody. But uh, yeah, it's any day. It could be out by the end of this week, hopefully. Call somebody or call and threaten somebody? And, you know, I call somebody this time. That's <laughs> the, There's a time and a place for everything, Mildred. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. so it's a bit of a tradition of mine to to start with the to start with the humble beginnings. With okay. that in mind, where where did the writing bug really hit really hit you, or, or is it something that's kind of always been there? Um, it's been there for a lot of years. Uh, when I was a little kid, okay. Um, first of all, I was reading books when I was young. I mean, I, anything I can get my hand on, I was reading it. I believe I read The Hobbit. I think I read The Hobbit in fifth grade, and. Uh, it was, you know, that's a lot to tackle, but it was, it was what I was interested in. Mm -hmm. And how I reacted after reading through all of the Lord of the Rings um, by junior high was I would go out in the backyard with Star Wars action figures and take them on a quest and literally just document it in a notebook. And I'm so glad that that notebook is lost to history because that's probably the worst story ever. But I took them all the way through this world that I built in our backyard in my mind. And I think that was my first attempt at fantasy. But um, you see the typewriter behind me. Mm -hmm. You mentioned it before we started. I've always had a typewriter around. When my mother was a typist and she was working on her brand new IBM electric because they were brand new back then, I got her old one. And I would just click away and write stories and they'd be a page, a half a page, sometimes 20 pages. These stories, they got me going. I mean, I hope that someday I would do it. And it was my children who finally pushed me to do it when I was mid thirties, single dad, raising three children, reading books with them as a book club, just so we had something to talk about at, at the dinner table. And we had a couple of whammies in a row. Some of those young adult, um, dystopia things that are overdone and the kids said dad why don't you write something and dreamers of Andalon was for them and it is for them but not just for them it's written because of them so does that make sense yeah and to to the, to that particular to that particular end let's talk let's talk about the early conceptualization so okay. Let's set the let's set the ground running since I'm pretty sh I'm pretty sure there's a few who um are less enlightened about and about um the Dreamers of Andalon series. So first right off, off, could you could you give the people in the temple the skinny on the an on the Andalon series? Okay, there's two main continents in this world. You have Andalon and you have Astia. Mm -hmm. Andalon is kind of a time set period you have wooden sailing ships you don't have firearms but you also have shield wall formations it's a very confused historical society and as these uh as it progresses the pirates are the ones who start manifesting magical powers that are emotional based mm -hmm. and they find out that they're being farmed by another continent a more advanced people that have literally been pulling these children as they're born, checking these babies. And when they find that they have powers, they if they're the powers they want, they take them away. Hey, there's something wrong with your child. We're going to go 
you know, have another one. Mm -hmm. If there's something, if it's a, a magical power they don't want, then they will call that child. They will bless it. And about two or three days later, the child dies from crib death and no one understands why. And uh, by the end of this story, the uh, lid is blown completely off the top. Uh, we roll into book two, book three, and uh, both continents are fighting their own independent struggle. So it's more than just fantasy. It's also kind of a post-apocalyptic science fiction, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of science-based magic. Yeah. And take... I remember. I remember that. One, I remember that one of the things you had, you had mentioned to me when I um, spoke with you at Cowtown was mm -hmm. the was the inclusion of some elements of Norse. Yes. Yes. Um, we have. You have two two main kingdoms. Yep. You have the Esterling Empire, which is a a confederation of city states. You have a continent below to the south that is. Uh, Kind of, I mean, you don't see much of it in the first book, but in the second book, you get a great exposure to it. You find out that it's uh, more of rum and coconuts kind of thing, more of a tropical setting. You move up north into the Nordic, and they're a very warfaring, berserker-type society. They have sustained themselves for 800 years by preying on the farmlands in the the center section of the uh, continent mm -hmm. and they'll sail up the rivers and come through and the setting of this book takes place about a decade after that was halted and stopped with the unification of the empire so they're frustrated they're not sure what to do how to uh you know do i make a do i do i work with the empire and and get what i want or do i take what i want so it's this is a very chaotic time in setting for this book. And when it when it comes to the, when it comes to that chaos, would it be fair to say that it's a, a chaos that's rife for rife for potential for mercenary work? Absolutely, um, the use of mercenaries is throughout this story. Um, in fact. I was uh, working on some things this evening uh, with book three. I don't know if I told you book three will be out in three weeks. And uh, one of the things, one of the aspects I was working on was that mercenary piece. Uh, something just wasn't quite working for me. And But it's there. It's uh, the people of Fioric are definitely be, being warmongering. You're going to find them all throughout, um, except in Loganshire. They are very despised in Loganshire. They're... Uh, because of resentment over the years, which actually affects some of the characters during the story with that bias. And when, when you mention when you mentioned despise, are we talking um, are we talking shoot on sight levels? No, not at this point, because the um, since the hostilities had ended for a decade, it's some of the older folks have resentment. Um, you know, it's I would say it's a type of prejudice. Um, real similar to what you'll see in the city of Weston, where that is shoot on sight um, because there was an open war with the people called the Piscari people who had a traumatic event at the beginning of book one. And a lot of them have migrated closer to the empire. So that's a shoot on sight issue. The people up north, um, it's more just resentment and get out of town. We don't want your kind here kind of thing. And that's going to that's gonna cause some of the characters to change their approach. Um, but it also, one of our main protagonists, Brian Braston, it's gonna, it, it haunts him everywhere he goes. He's always that northerner, that demon from the north, and no one can ever quite forgive him, even if he did nothing wrong. Um. Now, when it comes to the when it comes to the um, Viking end of the culture, especially from the north, um, does that does that in, does that also entail a raiding culture? Yes, but fully as it was the raiding culture until the city of Eston was built straddling at the main thoroughfare, the main river, so that kind of cut them off and and that's how you had that decade of peace um but even then there's a raid a nasty raid in book one and it's after the humiliation of the northern king 
he takes it out on this little village and it's this is not this book is not for the faint of heart um it is young adult mm -hmm. and adult um but it is along the lines of game of thrones type violence at times and the most violent scene that i've ever written takes place when skander braston raids the village of atarax and it's the one that, that people want to ask me about anytime they meet me what possessed me? Why did I even think about this? Because it's pretty much the the most violent thing I've ever ever written on paper. Yeah. Although although I'm pretty I'm pretty sure in this case there won't be the I won't have to play the severed head drinking game. <laughs> well, there's a few severed heads. I will say there's a few of those. Yeah, but a few a few severed heads is not is not enough to make is not enough to make for the drinking game. No, no, but um, <laughs> anytime children are harmed, you can have a uh, child harm drinking game in this book because there's, uh, you know, like I said, there's a loss, um, you know, with the, especially with the falconers attacking and taking and trying to cool off children. So yeah. if there's a if there's a dark side to it, it might be that. So mm -hmm. I'm sure you can make a drinking game from this story. I'm sure. <laughs> and, and heck, I'll play with you sometime, Mildred. Just call me up. <laughs> um now when now given that given that it, it that there was mention of um ability being cold let's talk a bit about that and this is something that i remember talking with you um, okay. to a great to a great extent so you're you developed a magic system that relies on elements and emotion yes yes it's what isn't evident in the first book mm -hmm. is how this comes about to these people who are kind of narrow minded with their thoughts and their science at the beginning of the book, it's magic. By the end of book three, actually by the end of book one, you're aware of it, but by the end of book three, you completely understand the science behind it. Mm -hmm. And you learn that this is actually our future. 1200 years in our future. Mm -hmm. um, that's another book that's coming out here uh, within a few months is the origin story. It's uh, which involves a biogenetic engineering uh, professor at uh, MIT. And it is the, the, the magic structure is based on our emotion. You may have an affinity to earth, wind, water, fire, but you could have hot emotions. You could have cold fluid emotions. For example, if you're brooding and sad and depressed and, oh, I miss that girl that I've loved for so long, blah, 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 then your, your magic will manifest one way. Maybe you'll commune with animals. Maybe that, that companionship will be drawn to you and you don't understand it. Whereas you could also have an affinity uh, for the same element and you're dealing fireballs or lightning bolts are coming down because you're very hot tempered. Now that said, some of us don't have control of our, over our emotions, which means when you want to have the fireballs, you might not be able to have them and vice versa. You need a tender touch and you're so worked up and angry you can't. So that brings the human aspect is it is a flawed system to the point that humanity is flawed and I want that character to be flawed and forced to work with others of either the same or different affinities. So it's quite unique. Mm -hmm. And to that to that end, is it is it a situation where so, where um somebody is somebody could on, is only going to have one talent or would they have multiple um interpretations of their magical talent? As they're learning about their talents. And I'm glad you said talents mm -hmm. because that's actually an argument in one of the books is talent is it a craft is it a power and it's really how you look at it but um it, how it really breaks down to is you can only have one affinity but you could have sensitivities to several for example if um since they're being farmed i mentioned that they're being farmed it's because that other continent wants their telepathic abilities or telekinetic in those cases mm -hmm. so what they do is they harvest something from the adrenal gland of the captured subject 
and create what's called an Astian pearl, or also called an oracle bead, depending on where you're at in the caste in the society. And by if you have tolerance for the bead, you can digest it and have some of those powers. It's at a lesser degree, but you can have those powers. So it's possible in my story that you could be a fire affinity. Obviously, that wouldn't work with water, mm -hmm. but it would work very well with air, which means you could be sensitive to the to the to the black astium pearl. They're mm -hmm. they're identified by color. So, all right. Um, now, when it comes to when it comes to emotions, obvi obviously, um, hot, hot and cold emotions can be re could be interpreted through fire and ice, but. What about what about um, elements like air, what about elements like air and earth? What sort of emotions would they um, likely be tied to? Well, if you're if you're earthbound or if your affinity is with earth, then think earthquakes and damaging tremors could yeah. be with the anger. But communing with plants and literally, you know, putting life into vines that can overgrow and overreach or even eavesdrop on a conversation through the blossoms um, is one is one going to be one of the uh, cooler emotions. Whereas making a tree stand up and do battle literally as a tank in warfare, that's going to be more of a hot emotion. So some will try and fail and not understand why, and it's just not in their nature. They're too good or too good hearted and they're not enough chaotic evil i guess to say mm -hmm. so so would so would it be fair of me to say that it's that um that when it comes to the when it comes to the element an element elements themselves don't have a particular emotion that they're tied to it's more of what that emotion do, um allows you to manipulate that element using which comes entirely from a person's past, okay? I mean, look at me. I mean, people look at me and they don't think of me as an author because I look like I should have a Viking war axe and just berserking through a crowd. Um, that's usually what people assume until they get to talk to me and understand, hey, yeah, I'm a writer, I've got two master's degrees, I'm halfway through a PhD. You know, it's more than meets the eye here. So now, the the element has nothing to do except your past mm -hmm. you may have uh, you may have had trauma in your past maybe you were bullied or assaulted when you were young and it affects you um, it's going to affect you in several different ways um, there are characters in my book that will freeze they're very talented with their with their talent but they freeze up because of something that occurred either in the recent past or their deep past. For example, and I'm gonna hold the book up for a minute, the ship on the front here, this is She-Wolf. Mm -hmm. And the captain of the She-Wolf is a character named Usari. She was kidnapped at age 13 after her mother was raped and killed in front of her by the people of Fjord. She was sold into human trafficking after her mother died. Mm -hmm. Two very major tra traumatic events happening. They continued while she was in servitude on board this vessel. She leads a mutiny. She becomes the captain of this ship. She starts developing powers. She's involved with the rest of the pirates who are essentially the good guys trying to put this chaos into an order that, that can benefit the society and free them from, from the other oppression. And she has to learn how to control her emotions because she's got trauma. She's got anger. She's hell bent on vengeance, but there's times where she has to learn love and forgiveness and understanding. And that's where the story really becomes a different kind of tale because that's happening with every character. Um, and they're all different. It's not, nothing's cliche with their emotions. This is character driven. Every character is different. Mm -hmm. And taking that into account, the other question I was, I'm going to ask when it comes to that magic system is the concept of that kind of thing getting out of, con out of someone's control, i.e. someone use, utilizing their talents without, without, um, 
without consciously doing so. Right. Is that, that something... definitely? Um... Sorry, go ahead. I overtalked. Yeah. Go is, ahead. is that something that is fe that is feasible with how the rules of it are set up? Absolutely. Um, at the very beginning, in the you're going to see your first snap of emotional allomancy with the the very first prologue battle scene where Bray and Braston is in an epic sea battle against the entire Esterling fleet because he's you know he's escaping with their winter stores. He's most wanted number one. He's asleep on the ship and he's dreaming. Mm -hmm. And things are happening around the vessel and drawn to him because of what's happening because of his dream state. That happens throughout the story where in in book two, someone knocks on the door of, of on the ship. They knock on the stateroom door and say, can you calm down? Because the seas are getting really bad out there. And it's so it's that kind of thing. It's it's definitely it's not something you have to control. It's something you have to control yourself because you're impacting what's around you and what's happening around you is impacting you. It's a, it's a balance. It's the perfect human and nature balance. And the other, now, obviously, any sort of system like this needs some sort of catch. And mm -hmm. aside from aside from aside from emotion, would one of the other catches with this system be um, stamina? I.e., using these talents can tire someone out. Absolutely. Take for example somebody who is prone to a berserking type mentality with fighting. One of these people from Fiori where you're going to physically exhaust yourself, but you have your enemy trapped in the hold and they won't come out because they know you're going to hack them to pieces. So you literally put the ship, the pressure around the ship where you're sinking the ship from the outside in by expanding the wood because of the pressure from the outside and you drown them to death. That takes so much mental fatigue that, that it's going to exasperate, excuse me, exasperate and exhaust you. And you might collapse on the deck of the ship during or after. And that's where, yeah, definitely stamina is a huge, huge um, problem with this because you have to work as a team. If you don't take turns, time out, help me out here, mm -hmm. refuel me. Um, there's a battle where evolving fire where they have bonfires just to keep that person fueled, but he's still going to get exhausted. And there are still things that are, uh, he could fall, you know, he could, he could, uh, he could fall prey to. So yeah, stamina is a huge issue with this. We're human. Um, and take now when it comes to the tech level of the setting, cause Okay. Obvious, obviously, even if somebody's doing a fantasy setting, that's still a wide net. That's still a wide net when it comes to levels of technology. Absolutely. Would it be would it be fair to say that you're that when it when it comes to the continent that a lot of the first book is taking place on, we're mm -hmm. in a very age of early age of sail um, kind mm -hmm. kind of approach with the tech, where um gunpowder exists but it's not but it's not commonplace yet exactly um a little bit of the backstory and i mentioned the piscari people mm -hmm. before this book takes place there was a war where they pushed those people back and how they did that was with the use of cannon but they didn't have cannons until the other society gave it to them to say okay we have to interfere. You guys need help against the society. Here's gunpowder. Here's a simple cannon. Now, we're not talking rifled bores. We're not talking exploding rounds. We're not talking anything like that. It's just a basic 10 or 12 pounder ball, maybe a five pounder, maybe some grape shot. Mm -hmm. Now, you add in again that human element. You have an engineer that is uh, from Fioric. He's a northerner, he's a pirate. And he is a genius. I des I describe him as looking no bigger than a 12-year-old boy. And he is a brilliant thinker. He's just, his mind makes up for any physical limitations of his, of his stature. 
And he will develop what he calls a hand cannon, which is basically a muzzle loading pistol mm -hmm. and no one's seen anything like it. What can happen from there is, is, you know, out of this world with possibilities because now that other continent must interfere again and they're going to have to change how much technology is that this world has access to because again it's about control and mm -hmm. it's about reigning in the chaos so there is interference yeah and when it comes given given that um i'm i'm pretty sure now given the given the fact that we're dealing with age of sale and, and the like Obviously, we've got. Obviously, it would be a crime if there weren't, if there wasn't some ship to ship combat, and ton of it. When it com when it comes to when it comes to that, what was one of the goals that you had in mind was to put some good old fashioned swash and buckle like one would expect from the likes of Errol Flynn. Exactly. I think about Errol Flynn. I grew up watching Errol Flynn movies. Um, Okay, I'm going to be honest with you, though. I mean, if you're going to mention Errol Flynn, i got to mention Princess Bride, which is probably <laughs> the greatest movie ever. And I think about that sword fight, okay, mm -hmm. between uh, Indigo Montoya and Wesley. Mm -hmm. And, well, I'm not really left-handed. Well, neither am I. And there's a lot of that kind of swordsmanship, but there is a talent. There is a type of swordsmanship I call a bladesman. Mm -hmm. They're dual wielding, they're, it's flows. Everything they do is almost a choreograph because of how their moves flow into another. And each time these people are involved in a battle, I'm literally, I'm doing everything I can to research not just sword fighting, but almost dance moves so that it's, I can see how plausible this fight really was. Anything that happens in this book, I want it to be possible. And that's the rule I put on me. So you've got cutlasses, you've got broadswords, you've got dual short blades, you've got axes, you've got muskets. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much, it's up to the individual person which they prefer and uh, for their ability. So it, it makes for an interesting battle because anything can happen, mm -hmm. anything. And and even and of course of course give, given the given all this variety there's the age old rule of of um there's no of there's no such there's no such thing as a dirt as too dirty of a trick exactly <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a lot of dirty fighting yeah. a lot of dirty fighting at this um, mm -hmm. sometimes that's the only way to win and so yeah that's I'm glad you mentioned that well I it. What always comes to mind is something, is something my mentor had, had said a long time ago of, we're not trying to hit a man while he's down, we're trying to kick him because that's easier. <laughs> that's true. That is true. It's uh, my dad. My dad grew up on the streets of Boston, and uh, he's a little guy. Um, people see pictures of us together, and I'm six foot two, 300 pounds, and my dad is five six five seven and buck 50 maybe and so we it looks like i had a really big mailman is what it looks like but my dad um he taught me how to fight dirty he was the first one to take me down on the ground and it was with a cheap shot with the knee and an elbow and uh i learned my lesson you don't bow up to dad when you're a teenager living in his house mm -hmm. but um again that was another day in time yeah but um you do you you when you're in a fight, when you're in an actual fight, a real street fight, it's everything goes. It's you're fighting for survival. And that's in this story. Mm -hmm. It's this isn't we're not fighting for two gentlemen to decide who wins, you know, the hand of that lady. No, this is this is you're here. I'm here. Only one of us is leaving kind of mm -hmm. mentality um, throughout the book. Yeah. I would make I would make the I would make the line of two men enter one man le one man leaves but um I don't have Tina Turner on speed dial. <laughs> well, I will say I will say it's not just the men fighting here the women in this there are so many 
just amazing female uh, leads. Uh, the main female protagonist, you sorry, mm -hmm. um, she's got knives everywhere on her person, and you never know when she's going to get pissed off and a knife is going to fling across the room, and uh, it's always at a surprise moment. So yeah, I even have some humor with that. Um, yeah, I'm pretty. Um I'm pretty sure there's going to be at least one one scenario of of, of a knife barely missing somebody. <laughs> there's uh I will say somebody holds a shot glass one time and uh I'm not going to give any more than that and I'm not going to say which book book it's in, but a shot glass is held and they're about to reveal something she doesn't want them to know and that shot glass literally blows up in their hand and uh knife is stuck in the wall behind them. Yeah. So uh, there's some fun in it, mm -hmm. um, and of course, of course, um, look, there, I do think a, I do think a lot of people. Um, I don't want to say misunderstand. I think a better term would be disunderstand the concept of comic relief because they focus way too much on say the bad examples of comic relief where you have that annoying character who's supposed to be funny and isn't. But, right. Comic, but comic relief is a pressure valve. It is, and you need you need to you need to turn the knob, otherwise too much pressure is going to build, and you're going to end up with um with a can of Pepsi in your freezer. That's true. That is true. It, it's a breathing moment in a in a novel. It's uh, with every crescendo and respite to catch your breath and go back into another crescendo. I like to add a little humor when you're relaxed, yeah. when you're coming through a moment, maybe it was emotional, maybe maybe a little violent. We're gonna throw a little in and I mentioned that these are pirates, but they're not classic pirates. They're not not in the way that you would think of swashbuckling, or you know, I got me a hook on my hand, you know, that kind of thing. It's it's not that kind of pirate. These guys are fashioned off of guys and gals are fashioned off of my old shipmates when I was in the Navy, mm -hmm. we would have a blast. I mean, we would tease each other. We'd make fun of each other. We laughed at everything that wasn't trying to kill us. And then we laughed at that too. And it was really about just easing the tension. Yeah. But you do have one character throughout this entire series that is a comedian. He he's, takes that pirate persona and pushes it to the limit where it annoys others around him. But then the rest of the crew just think he's the coolest guy on the ship and they all love him. And those irritated by him don't understand why he's so lovable until they get to a point where they realize he just makes you feel good about the situation, even though it was a really crappy day. Yeah. And uh, that's based on real friendships. So and it that's how I use it. It definitely makes sense. Um, although when you had, when you had mentioned that he's somebody that people anno people annoy but everybody likes, for some reason I ended up thinking of Guy Gardner. I have no idea why. Okay. Um, I think it has okay. to do with the fact that in 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 some of the Green Lantern comics there was the notion of there 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 was um there have been there have been stories where Gardner um anno ended up an ended up um really annoying the holy hell out of Hal, but ever but. Every, but all the guardians still liked him and did and didn't see it. Yeah, which because he has a he, he's part of the family and he has a role to play. Yeah, and that's what it's about. Yeah, and it's all to, about our tribe. And to be to be quite honest, the the whole the whole black the whole black hat hook hook for a hand th approach with um with pirates. Given the way you describe the this particular setting, wouldn't fit, and that's it key doesn't. Thing is make, it is doesn't making sure that um, what you're doing always has a use. I believe I believe the term is verisimilitude, um, or, if, or everything if has a function. Sorry, you're breaking up a little bit. And if I if I can't use if I can't use that term properly, I can just bring out Chekhov's gun. <laughs> okay. If the gun if the guns on yeah, the, if the guns on the table is going to get fired. Yeah. 
It's true. That is true. But it's uh, yeah, it's it's a different kind of it's a different kind of pirate. They're real. They're human. That's that's what I can promise you about every one of these characters. They're going to remind you of somebody in your life, somebody you love, somebody you hate. Um, if you're rooting for somebody in the first few chapters, you might be rooting against them at the end of the book or the next book. Um, if I promise anything, I promise that every character will get some kind of cheering at some point and some kind of damning at some other point. And that's because I want to keep you on your toes. The, uh, you know, I try to keep everybody guessing how this is really going to end. Now, when it comes to the flow of the books, did you, did did you intend on do on doing it where there's a single character that's get, that's going to be getting the majority of the focus, or is the character is the focus shifting between chapters? Okay, it's like Game of Thrones in that sense, mm -hmm. where it the point of view shifts quite often. Um, that is kind of confusing at the beginning if you're not used to that. I've mm -hmm. gotten feedback. Um, not negative feedback, but that a lot of people were like, okay, I was confused at first. I mean, for the first couple of chapters, I didn't understand. I thought this was short stories, but they always say that by the time they're at chapter six, they're like, oh, I get it. This comes together. And then they just watch it. Um, a professor of literature up at Midwestern State University, um, he's 83 years old, retired, sent him a copy of my book because he mentored me years ago. Mm -hmm. And he said, your debut novel, you took not two, not three plots, but you had six plot lines that came together at the end seamlessly. He said, how the hell did you do that? And I just thought that's normal. It matched the book. It's mm -hmm. the way it should have been. Yeah. But it is. It, it is. It's about six narratives that bring all these characters together not just at the end of book one, but again during book two, and again at the end of book three. At the in the final at book three, I was after a lot of the resolution. I'm like, wow, this is pretty much the same set of characters going through. This is we're on a straight line. I haven't done that in three books, yeah. so it was kind of weird for me. So, yeah. um, I'm not sure if you've seen it, but would you, would you say that when it comes to the portrayal of pirates with it? with this setup that it would have more in common with black sails than pirates of the Caribbean. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, take one character from pirates of Caribbean and throw them into black sails. Mm -hmm. And that's more like what we have here. So, yeah. Yeah, I can get that. Now, when it came to the conceptualization of Andalon's um, setting, was okay. it, a this is a question that might sound like a chicken and egg situation, but when it came to those early concepts, did you have a certain type of character in mind that you wanted to do first, or did you have a setting in mind that you wanted to do first? I wanted to write about ships first. I don't know what, maybe it was I had just retired from the Navy um, recently, mm -hmm. what it was. I wanted something seafaring. And I wanted it to be a different kind of story. I knew that much of the story would be on land, but I wanted the ship element, so I brought the pirates in. And at first, I really expected it to just be a pirate tale until the world building took over. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I realized this is this is beyond pirates. I mean, it's it's. I got a review a couple of weeks ago that said it was genre defining not just that i'm defying my genre but i'm defining a new genre by calling it pirate fantasy but even then we're not constrained which is pirates i mean this is science fiction this is metaphysical this is science mm -hmm. it's different it's an adventure that's all i can really say is it's an adventure and it has everything i love except dragons. I didn't put any dragons in this. So yeah. Although it's kind of just wrong. I've had some, I've had some people nickname me, nickname me the dra the dragon or, or in some cases the ice dragon. So I guess I fill that quota. 
Um, yeah, we talked about it. you mentioned that at the uh, at the uh, cow, at the uh, Cowtown event. Yeah, I think I think it's I think it's because of of me being too damn tall for everybody. Oh. Um, but when it comes now, I do want to focus a bit on a bit on the pirate thing now. Everybody has their own answer to this question. I've asked this a bunch of times when I um, do my own response to talk like a pirate day because I've, for years I've said, don't talk like a pirate because you're get because you're gonna suck at it. Play a pirate themed <laughs> game instead, or 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 um watch or watch a pirate th or watch a pirate themed thing. And the sole reason I ended up doing that is, um, one of my old one of my old teachers would would. Ev would um show a f what for for that kind of event would show a few episodes of the Pirates of Dark Water. Okay. Which is uh, which very much a very much a, a deep very much a deep cut if there ever was one. <laughs> and just the but for but um everybody knows to some level the mythology when it comes to something like pirates but right what for you what's the appeal in that particular mythology for me mm -hmm. it's the, it's the swashbuckling because of the type of action it's the opportunity for sea battles mm -hmm. um that's something that people point out right off the bat they say that the sea battles are believable that they literally feel like they're on the ocean and this could have really happened in the way i described it and that's you know because of all the battle scenarios we did in the navy i know you know you take that you put it age of sail you fit it in it works but for me really to the appeal just the opportunity to do something different uh, one of the first books i read early in my life was kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson and just an amazing pirate story of a young man wakes up, he's on the ship and boom, he's living with pirates and his life changes. And I wanted to bring some of that element, which funny story, when I first topped the chart as a number one bestseller in my genre, I beat out Kidnap was number two and I topped that classic when that happened. And, and that was remarkable because it meant so much. But also, um, seafaring is in my blood. And I know how corny that sounds, but my f I, I was in the Navy, so I'm a son of a sailor. My dad's dad, was uh, he died in World War II aboard the USS Mount Hood in that massive explosion. So he's, I'm a son of a son of a sailor. But then his father, I'm sorry, his, his wife's father was a harpoonist on a whaling ship. And it goes all the way back. There were generations of whalers mm -hmm. in my background. So in my, my family tree. So yeah, it, it's just, I've always been fascinated with the, with the sea. That's why I joined the Navy. I wanted to see what it was all about after growing up in Texas. So. Um, and now, now a lot of, a lot of authors and a lot of creators that I've spoken with have um, talk, have talked about the research that they that they did, and obviously you had you had a bit you had a bit of an advantage um, given what you just mentioned. But when you when when it came to the idea of okay, we're doing this during the during, with a kind of age of sale level of tech, um, was there a fair amount of research that you had that you had put in that you had put in? Mm -hmm. Constant, constant. You know, I'm. I don't know if I told you one. One of my advanced degrees mm -hmm. is uh, history. I'm. A, I'm a historian, so that's one thing that I've. You know, thought that I was going to do was write about history and mm -hmm. Native American warfare was what my my focus was. Um, so I don't put anything on paper if it's not plausible or happened. Um, the worst, most violent violent thing in my book came from research that I did as a historian. It's based on something that actually happened. Um, as far as the pirates go, I mentioned the technology. There's a scene, there's several scenes, but there's this one scene where you kind of escape a situation and need something different. Mm -hmm. 
And of course, that engineer is going to bring something. That MacGyver type character is going to bring something that he has. Hey, I've got something for this. And without giving too much detail, I'm going to say it's a round that they were able to put in the canon that saved the day and changed the entire way they fight. And that is a real thing. It actually existed um, even to the name, uh, the type of round that I use, that name existed um, as early as um, 14 and 1500. And it's very easy to make. And it was probable that it could fit in the situation. And I used it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I research technology constantly, um, even horsemanship. Um, I don't know a lot about, I grew up in Texas, so I know a little bit about horses, but I didn't grow up around them and on them. But the Piscari people do. So there are certain things that take after, you know, like like the uh, different bands of uh, Native Americans, like the Comanche were horse masters. And that's reflected with the Piscari people of this, this mastership of, of how, to, how to fight on horseback. So that's research. Yeah, everything I put down is research. Yeah. And... When it came to when it came to doing research, was were there any bits of getting hands on when it come when it came to old ships or old tech? Yeah, I whenever I'm writing, I have like a little easel, like you might put a little page of paper and transpose from or a book, and I've got pictures of ships all the way down to the parts. Um, I want to know what knots are used. I want to know, you know, what part of the sail, you know, do you do this with um, for each situation? Because there, there's a situation where a um, character is literally driving the ship by themselves mm -hmm. and it's using their powers, but they're not just out there. Okay, we're just sailing. We're using magic and we're sailing. No, it's. She's lashed onto the helm. She's doing this. She's got control of this. And she's working that ship like a crew of, of 30 men or, you know, and she's controlling it all by herself. 13-year-old um, girl. And it's just because of, she's such a bright young lady. She's been paying attention when the crew was on board. Yeah. So, yeah, very plausible. Um and I, I know we I know we talked about not falling into some of the stereotypes with pirates, but I do but I do have to I do have to ask this. Now I'm not I'm not gonna I'm not gonna ask whether or not this was in the book, but when you were writing, were there any moments of um, shanties in the back of your head? <laughs> yeah, um, quite a few times um, in jokes. Oh, there's this one. I used to scuba dive and I remember this German pilot that was a friend of mine that made a joke about American beer that found its way into the story. And at first it was kind of a dirty joke. So actually it was a very dirty joke. So I since censored it a little bit, made, cleaned it up a little bit, but those kind of things are always going on in my head. Um, especially when they walk into the bar, I'm hearing music, I'm hearing, a bard in the back and it really it sounds more like you know irish folk songs um it's like you got the irish rovers in the back singing while you walk in and you're hearing barrett's privateers yeah. that song barrett's privateers is probably the most accurate shanty of them all here with this set of pirates because they're that kind of pirate so yeah yeah I would I wouldn't be surprised I wouldn't be surprised if in your re, in your research folder you had a few Alestorm albums in the process. Hey, you you know what? That's funny because you did mention that um, you mentioned Alestorm and I laugh. I love those guys. Um, I've got a Pandora station of Dropkick Murphy that I listen to when I'm working out, and Alestorm comes up all all the time and. If I could have fit an anchor into a scene in the way that they use it in their songs, I would have done that. But I, I haven't. But I actually wrote to them, and I haven't heard anything back yet. But I did. I reached because my books sell overseas, and this is a you know they're a worldwide group, mm -hmm. and 
I was also, I was a number one bestseller in UK. So I'm, I reached out to these guys. I said, hey, I said, pirate of, uh, author of Pirates, singers of Pirates. Um, I've got some Vikings. You got a song where the Pirates fight the Vikings. Let's, let's work. Let's collaborate. Let's have some fun. Mm -hmm. Let's go kick some ass, you know, and mm -hmm. let's share platform for a minute and just have some fun with it, just yeah. even if we do it one time. So I'm still waiting for a response, L Storm. I would love to hear from you. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> be even better if you if you manage to get them and Twitter in, in in on that since since you've got since you've you've got some you've got some elements of of Viking and you've got some elements of pirate. Right. Um, yeah. Even the. And I know I know somebody might say, but but Twitter's from but Twitter's from the Faroe Islands. Does, is that going to count? Yes. Especially, especially, especially given that the last album that tw that Twitter put out was all about go, all about um, well, hell. As in the half rotted yeah. hell. Um. But when it when it when it comes to, when it comes to that um. Some I've seen some authors who prefer writing and brainstorming in complete silence, and some who have their own personal um, soundtrack that they'll li that they'll listen to to help them write. Would it be fair of me to say that you fall into the latter category? Um, if there's a lot of vocals, I can't listen to it when I'm thinking about the story. Like when I'm driving to work, you're gonna laugh. Uh, if I tell you what's on my playlist when I'm driving, you know, to my day job and doing stuff like that, um, because I don't want a lot of vocals. Um, it literally, um, I don't even think I'm going to tell you because it's that silly, but it's, a, it's the same kind of soundtrack you would hear on a, on a fantasy game. Like think Skyrim, think the music in the background during Skyrim and something like that. I'm listening to a lot of that because it's given me the same kind of vibe so that, you know, like I'm in a Nord tavern or mm -hmm. I'm, you know, here or I'm there, and then some Celtic chant will come in and it kind of just gets the brain going. Yeah. You know, this, I could see this happening here and that song is definitely driving it. So yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pass judgment on that kind of thing for one very specific reason. The playlist that I use for some, for some of the games at my table uh -huh. If you were to if you were to combine all the runtime of all the tracks that I use, it is twenty six hours long. Oh wow! Of just of okay. just different um th of just different themes, some stuff from Skyrim, some stuff from Final Fantasy twelve, some stuff some stuff from um, Godzilla, some stuff from Philip Glass. It's all over the place. Okay, okay, so you get it, so you understand. Yes. So, okay, yeah, so it's. Some of it now, I will say, some of it is kind of a German fantasy. Mm -hmm. There's a group out there that they have vocals, and I have no idea what the hell these guys are saying or what they're singing about because it's in German. And it works for me because the sounds, again, make me feel like it could be, you know, one of my settings. So, yeah. So it's, yeah. I think music is important. Yeah. Um, you'd prob you'd probably get a kick in that regard. You'd probably get a kick out of um, Heide Volk. Okay. Um, well, they've done a f well, they've done a few tracks in English. Heide Volk is from is um is du is a, a Dutch. I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah, they're a Dutch folk metal act. I know um, exactly who you're talking about. They um. The thing that's interesting about them is that they have a a choir style with their vocals. Instead instead of going soprano, I'm, I'm going they go, to Pandora right now. I hope you see me doing this. I'm looking to see because I think I know exactly who that is, and they are on that playlist I play. Oh, nice. Um, because uh, kind of a Celtic feel, right? Um, not not necessi not necessarily. They. Ha they um like like i said they they're from they're from um Ge they're from gelderland which is in the region of the uh, ne netherlands okay um so it's still it's still a very scan it's still a very scandinavian style of um of work for them 
Right. So I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily call call their approach Celtic. Well, no, there's um, with the with the station that I made. Uh, you're right. We've got the standard Scandinavian like Skald and stuff like that. Um, you got some of the deeper stuff that I love to listen to. But my wife always walks in when it's borderline demonic chant. <laughs> but it's like, honey, it's Nordic. It's you know, there. This is what is going on here. But it's yeah, uh, it's I think we're, I think we're thinking of the same group yeah. and I love their sound. It's very throaty, very yeah. deep. Yeah. And it's it's like a chant. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's it's like that. Gosh, what is that Mongolian group? You know, that the Mongolian who. metal group I'm talking about? Yeah. The who? Yeah. I love those guys. Mm -hmm. And they're on. I put them on this. So I'll get some of that going on sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um that just in book two, I've got some, uh, I've got some characters, uh, some of the bad guys, if you will, that I think of them while they're doing their their humming and their their swaying because they have earth magic that they control. They're doing that. I hear that kind of music going on. That that's what they're chanting to. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, definitely. That it's it could get literally make the dead get up and walk if it's that powerful. Yeah, although um, I'd I'd say some of the dead would end up walking simply because there's no more room in the earth. <laughs> yes, I had True. to make at least. I know I know I'm a month late, but I had to make at least one day of the dead joke. That's funny. That is funny. That, that takes me back right there. So. You so um when it comes to when it comes to this when it comes to the series I already meant um you if I'm not mistaken the fir the um the first two books in the um Dreamers of Andalon series are um are are cur are currently out you're planning on put on um getting those converted into audiobook form yes book one should be any day book two. Be a few months from now mm -hmm. um we're waiting for the release from book one before we start the production because that's a investment that's a lot of money to invest and you kind of want to see how book one does before you commit that much into it um but the goal is before the end of this next year to have all three of them up and uh i'm pretty sure we're going to hit that i think we're going to have book two up um probably march um, at the latest, and I think book three by summer for sure. So we're working on it. And I can I can definitely um, see see that now. When it well, we meant we mentioned this we mentioned this earlier, but um, as far as as far as a window, when do when do when do you see um when do you see the uh, the um audible version of book one coming around? Well, literally any day. Um, I submitted it on the 2nd of October. And that's, um, it used to be one to two week turnaround mm -hmm. when you have everything right to the sound quality. Cause that's the key. That's the killer is the sound quality has to be within their standards. We passed the preliminary tests. There's no reason that, that this book will be rejected for quality. It's, definitely professional studio, professional actor, um, professional grade. He's, he's produced several, the guy who produces Jason Sullivan. He's, he knows what he's doing. So really we're just looking at backlog. And I got an email about, about three or four days ago that was disheartening because they said that they are backlogged. They're hiring addition, additional people to come on board. And they said that it is taking, 30 full working days. Well, my 30th working day is in two days. That's the 18th. The last time that I called and talked to the ACX folks, that's who's um, over the production of Audible, mm -hmm. the young lady I spoke to there was fantastic. And she said, it doesn't look like there's anything that's going to hold up this book. She said, I will call or I would, if I were you, I would call if it's not up and ready by the 18th. So I've got her on speed dial. I'm waiting. We've got two days. Um, 
I can I can look right now while we're on here and I can tell you if it's uh, if it popped up tonight. And uh, as I do this, I check it. I check it often. Is it is it up? Is it uh, is it going? Is it ready? And no, it's still pending. So. Yeah, any day, literally, I'll, I'm, I'll shoot you a message as soon as it pops up. I will do that for you, Mildred. I, I do appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um and i'm pre i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure it will it's just ev it's just ev everything everything's topsy-turvy these da these days as it is yeah. yeah this covid mess really threw everybody uh, a monkey wrench mm -hmm. back in the spring and that's what's affecting them that's and then the backlog they they said in the letter they have they're overwhelmed with a lot of poor sound quality submissions right now so they have to weed through everything. Um, they have a standard. And like I said, ours meets that standard. It's going to be, um, you know, it's gonna be one of the best audiobooks out there, especially with Jason Sullivan. This guy's crazy. I mean, his voices, I love this guy, all right? He and I, we're buddies now, okay? We call up and laugh and, and talk about the characters. He's got a different voice for every character and we have a lot of characters in the series. And I'm, and like I said, I'll definitely be keeping a cl close eye and look and looking forward to how that um to, how that how that comes about, especially okay. especially since in the in the last in the last five months I've been do I've been doing more um audiobook stuff so I can squeeze it in while um tra while training. Um, but with nothing wrong with that. I listen to books all the time. Yeah, definitely for the audiobooks. Mm -hmm. But with that, with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy and enjoying the um, insanity that comes around. My pleasure, and I, I don't throw that around. When I say my pleasure, I mean it. I had a blast. Um, I love talking to you. We didn't have enough time to talk because the place was so busy, so many people there. Mm -hmm. But you know, I'm glad to be here tonight, and uh, you know. Invite me back anytime. Um, I've got other projects. We could talk about those when they come out. Mm -hmm. And of course, like I said, anytime, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> I love it. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>